this afternoon, we are welcoming a few new people who are here for the first time and other people who have been here before for a visit and some who have attended a conference. We want you all to know that we're delighted to have you here again and we trust that the entire conference will be productive of a wealth of good that you will take home with you and that you will be able to use throughout this wonderful coming new year of 1967. Regardless of all the predictions that have been made, we know that the realm of the individual can always maintain its peace and equilibrium regardless of whether or not the world is crumbling away around us. So we are calling for everyone in the world to be able to enjoy a profitable new year but not always profitable from the standpoint of the material world entirely, but also from the spiritual. We mustn't neglect the spiritual. Many people neglect the spiritual, and then they find out in the long run that because they neglected the spiritual, that they don't have things so good in the material either. So now we're going into the subject at hand, the subject of Christ consciousness and how to develop the Christ consciousness. Now, in order to uh, do this, to bring forth this information that can be useful, we're going to have to resort, of course, to some academics and uh, fit some patterns that are more familiar to most of you. So I will require your attention. We can consider this this afternoon to be somewhat of a classroom and uh, while I don't always say that I have eyes in the back of my head you all look like pretty good pupils so uh, I trust that if the teacher can be assisted by the teacher that you will be able to get something of value for your souls. Now a lecture such as this on how to develop the Christ consciousness is something that I think all of the people in our whole activity should be able to have and enjoy. And in one way, I regret that it has to be given to a small audience. But on the other hand, the master's viewpoint is this. He says, I do not intend to preserve the delicacies always for the people that come in last. And so he says that there should be some reward for those who come in first. Now, of course, Jesus said the first shall sometimes be last and the last shall sometimes be first. But we trust that all of you will be both first and last victors over all your problems. Now, in developing this lecture on how to develop the Christ consciousness, we must first of all make some definitions that will be understandable to us all. We need common denominators. So the first thing we're going to have to do is determine what consciousness is. Now, I may have my definition of consciousness, and you may have yours, but I prefer to stay with the simple, and therefore I would like to say that as I see it, consciousness is an ever-flowing stream of intelligence that possesses the capacity of awareness of its environment and an awareness that may go beyond its environment, an awareness that may go far beyond its environment, but basically it is awareness starting with the self, with simple consciousness, being aware that you are you. 
then being aware that there are other people on the planet and objects, conditions, and places and things. This consciousness that I have in a certain sense defined for you possesses also the capacity to deal in subtleties. Now by that, of course, we even mean innuendo. Someone comes up to you and, good morning, how are you? And they don't mean a word of it. They don't care how you are. They're just following a platitude, a custom of the world. Now, you really should be able to distinguish between hypocrisy and sincerity. And most people do, but they do it innately. I mean, we don't even stop, so sensitive are some people, we do not even stop to consider. We already know because of subtle spiritual facilities that are within us. Now, the subtleties of consciousness and the capacity of consciousness itself to deal in the subtleties of others has come to be an innate art an art that even children are capable of practicing. But we are talking now about consciousness in its lower ramifications. We're talking about consciousness that may deal in feelings and thoughts all the way from the stage of babyhood where we have a child that is not capable of reading, a child that is not capable of speaking the language, and yet this child deals in images. And the translation of these images and desires into cogent symbols within, which make it possible for the young child to identify its mother, uh, its feeding time and toileting time and all the other little problems that babies get into. The transition period from babyhood to childhood to adulthood and so forth goes through many stages. And these stages are more or less stages that blend from one into the other. They don't uh, have abrupt break-off points like uh, stair steps. You've probably heard the story about the young boy who said that when he was 16 that he thought that he knew a great deal more than his father and he felt that his father knew really very little. And he said he was amazed when he became 21 at how much his father had learned in four years. And so there, there really are no break-off points here that are really stair steps. There's a generally a smooth flow, an interblending of one stage of consciousness into the next. But all of this is, of course, dealing with the mundane, but we must deal with the mundane and the realities of the mundane, of the earthy, before we can deal with heavenly realities. Unfortunately, there are an awful lot of people in the world who trick themselves and have an idea that spiritual facilities and the development of Christ consciousness is a breakaway from all of the natural phenomena of life. Now this is not so, but it is a trick of the deceitful forces of the world, and it is also a trick of those who would purvey confusion into the consciousness of people by just making the world seem so complicated that they just can't cope with it anymore, and therefore they either vegetate, uh, do nothing except what's necessary to live, or they are stimulated, in some cases, to pursue the mysteries of life a little more, or in other cases, they may even rebel against life and its confusions by nonconformism. All of this, of course, is a part of the miasmas of life. But Christ consciousness is not so. Here we deal with what we could call a naked reality, but which I prefer to call crystal clear Christ clarity. Now, if that's a lot of C's, it's to your credit. But the whole idea here is that Christ consciousness 
is as natural as material mundane consciousness and just as easy to assimilate. But St. Paul pointed out a formula which I think is very wonderful. He said, this old man of the flesh must be put off and we must put on the new man of the spirit. This seems to imply the denial of oneself as being strictly a moral, uh, a human being, one who is capable of sentient ideas. And it seems to imply that we are going to put off all of those things. And so a lot of people who are literalists take the idea that all of our qualities that are of the earth and mundane and earthy and so forth must be put away. And uh, this develops, when they do succeed in putting them away in their own opinion, it develops a sense of criticism concerning other chilas and brothers and sisters on the path. In other words, other spiritual people or other spiritual seekers or some of their compeers, the people that they're associated with and around them, they look at them with a sort of an aloof attitude as from an ivory tower. And this, of course, repels Christ's consciousness. So one must be extremely careful that uh, the quality, which is not a quality at all, but the, the condition of criticism and of uh, condemnation and of judgment of other people does not arise from our desire to uh, develop and find Christ's consciousness. There is a tendency on the part of people to fool themselves, in other words. They think that they have received Christ's consciousness simply because they have put away some of the conditions of the world. In other words, they don't smoke as much anymore and they don't have quite as many highballs or maybe they don't have any and they've given up this and they've given up that and the other thing and they seem to feel that Christ's consciousness is developed by denying certain things that the world does and that when one gives all these things up, now uh, automatically Christ's consciousness should just rush in. Here is a very strange thing, an enigma. I'm referring now to George Gurdjieff who wrote the, the tales of Beelzebub to his grandson and uh, numerous other books and writings and founded an institute in Paris and was quite well known as a mystic. He didn't give up his cigarettes or his vodka or anything else. He often tippled a great deal. Yet he was the teacher and guru of that great Russian writer, Auspensky. In other words, Auspensky, who wrote, I believe, the Tertium Organum, but at the same time, he was a disciple of George Gurdjieff, who did all these awful things, you see, from the standpoint of the ordinary theologian and uh, the person that is searching for God. Somehow or other, we develop the idea that all searchers for God are already saints and that all self-styled masters and mystics are already saints and we also have a tendency to feel that every person that abstains from this and abstains from that is just a little bit better than those who indulge. Once again I go to St. Paul where he refers to the subject of meat eating which is one of the subjects that poses quite a problem for a lot of people because they seem to feel that the eating of meat will prevent them from having Christ's consciousness. Well, all I can say about the whole thing in the development of Christ's consciousness is that as I have found it, Christ's consciousness is not developed by outer things, by their acceptance or their indulgence or any of these things. The absence of certain qualities in people or the presence of them does not seem to determine whether or not they are capable of rising up to the level of Christ's consciousness. Some time ago, St. Paul said that, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who hath bewitched you, having begun 
in the spirit are you now made perfect by the flesh. There we are, right there. There, there you have it. It is not in outer things that one has the capacity to achieve their freedom. You don't get it by abstaining or you don't get it by doing something of necessity. Because Christ consciousness seems to just be born in some people. At a very early age it begins to manifest. Others work at it all their life and sometimes burst through to it just before they leave the planet. Others work at it for a year or two and suddenly it manifests. Some work at it for ten years and suddenly it comes. Some twenty. There are various stages because, that is, I'm speaking in, in time sequences, there are various stages because people are all different. Now it's very important that you do not hinder yourself. You saw an example of that a moment ago. I was straining to get an idea out of my subconscious. And the harder I strained, the more I created a mental block which prevented that thought from coming through at the exact moment that I wanted it. We have to learn to turn every defeat into a victory because we all have similar problems. And so when it comes to developing Christ consciousness, we must first of all remove our blocks, our human blocks that make us blockheads because that's what we really are when we try to rely on mortal wisdom alone. Actually, the college professors and the brilliant men of our nation are very much dependent on the qualities of divine intelligence within themselves. The only thing is they will not acknowledge it. They use it all the time. Supposing that their blessed body elemental, which they do not acknowledge, would fail to assist them in creating the proper body chemistry so that everything would flow across the brain in its normal pattern. Of course, all these subconscious reactions they just take for granted. They just happen. We know that they do not happen by accident, that they are all part of the divine intelligence. Our body functions, the functions of the sympathetic nervous system, and all of our parts of our body, all function by God's grace. But of course the materialist does not think that this is true. He seems to consider that all the parts of this little watch that we are, our mainspring, the heart, and all the little coils and gears and wheels and wires and whatnot, that was taken up in an airplane and then dropped down to the ground, put itself together on the way. When it got down here, we had a nice 21 joule Swiss watch. It all took place just automatically. It has its own inherent intelligence. It might have been generated by a couple of raindrops or something in the clouds as it whizzed down to the ground. Only God knows. The whole idea here is that they seem to feel that matter created itself. And people are just wedded to this idea that is the scientists today. Our own brother, Norman Thomas Miller, who is a very splendid member of our staff, has his grandfather, Norman Thomas, who is constantly going around with the idea that the world was created by happenstance and that everything is based on intelligence. You understand, just on worldly intelligence and man is his own creator and so forth. Well, actually, it happens to be true, you see, that man is his own creator, but he just doesn't know how to put all these things into focus. And if you try looking through a telescope sometime at either end and you start wiggling this back and forth, you can always throw it out of focus. There's only one little spot where it's in focus. So we have to be able to focus ideas. It's not enough to have them. It's not enough to be intelligent. It's not enough to have uh, the idea that you should pray and be able to say your prayers at night. There is a great deal more to this universe than what people, and I mean all people, including the scientists, have ever stopped to think about. Yet, all the books that have been written in the world seem to contain all the knowledge that there is in the world. 
And when we pick up some of these books, we are just absolutely smitten with the idea that this is the ultimate. This book is tops until we read the next one. And it reminds me very much of the salesman who was selling washing machines. And the lady had her secret doubts because she'd been stung a few times. And she said, well, now I want to know that this washing machine will do everything I want it to do. I want the best washing machine in the world. And so the man looked at her and he said, well, madam, I'm very sorry. He said, I can only sell you the second best washing machine in the world. That's not good enough for me, she snapped back at him. She said, I want the best. He said, that hasn't been made yet. And that's the whole idea with life as we consider it from the standpoint of transcendence. Now, there's a difference between the word trance and transcendence. A trance is where you lose your consciousness. And where are you? Only God knows. But in transcendence, you know right where you are. Come right in. I see the planes are making it through fog, smog, <laughs> and everything else. Welcome to Salt Lake. I see it hasn't dried up yet. <laughs> well, we have been started now, and we're halfway through our lectures, so how much you people are going to get out of it will depend on how much you need. Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't to me. That's why I said it. Anyway, we're on the subject of how to develop Christ consciousness. And the first things that I'm trying to bring out here are the fact that abstinence, non-meat uh, eating or meat eating, and uh, being a good little boy in every way, as human beings think, does not guarantee this to us. So I'm going to come back now to this point. You cannot have Christ consciousness guaranteed to you by reason of what you don't do. And sometimes it's more by what you do than it is by what you don't do. This is what I want to bring out. That's why this George Gurdjieff, in spite of his drinking of vodka and smoking of big black cigars, was able to develop a very high state of Christ consciousness. However, I happen to believe that he would have been better off without the black cigars and without the vodka. But it doesn't pay to judge superficially on what people are because just as it does not necessarily prove because you eat meat that you do not have Christ consciousness, so, because you don't eat meat, it doesn't prove that you have it, you see. I know people on both sides of the fence. And so the, the biggest thing of all is to get rid of your blocks about what you have to do. Don't start judging other people because that is a diversion that will take your consciousness away from the source of Christ's consciousness. And if I start looking out here and I start figuring out what everybody is, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to stop myself right in my tracks because my attention isn't on my presence, uh, the presence of God. It isn't on uh, the laws of God. My attention is on a human being who may be stumbling and he may be going up. The most important thing to remember is that people are going up. They're going up all the time. And if you think something about them that is not good and decide they don't have Christ consciousness because of something they do, you actually are putting a stumbling block in your brother's pathway because your thoughts have got wings on them and your thoughts go out into their world and they lodge there in their subtle body or their desire body and... At a certain time, when the human smog level gets so high, I'm talking about when thoughts begin to accumulate of a negative quality in their world, 
Your little thought may be the, the feather straw that breaks the camel's back of their desire to do right. And you may be to blame by putting this stumbling block in their pathway for their defeat. So remember, it is always well to withhold, you hear this? Withhold judgment on everybody. That doesn't mean, as you'll learn in another lecture, that you cannot have discrimination. Because you'd be an awful poor bird if you were flying out here without a rudder. You have to have discrimination. You have to be able to steer yourself straight. But you have to learn how to walk the razor's edge between criticism, condemnation, and judgment and discrimination, which is a quality of the Christ and a quality of Christ consciousness. I think I made this clear as clear as I intend to at this moment. We want to get on now with some of the methods of developing Christ consciousness. You recall when I first started, I went into sequences on babyhood and the development of simple consciousness. I want to explain to all of you, dear people, that you must use your own natural God-given facilities and consciousness to develop Christ's consciousness. And you cannot do it if your mind is 100% of the time involved in outer world human affairs. You must have time for meditation. You must have time for reflection. You must have time for attunement. You must have time to get the ideas of the masters and assimilate them. You must have nourishment within yourself because the tiny infant Christ man is already in your being. The Christ man manifests as what we have called and the masters have chosen to call the threefold flame of love, wisdom, and power with all of its positive aspects blazing on the altar of your heart, depicted here right in the heart of man. The nature of that tiny, minute flame is all positive. But that positivity is not intended to stand still. It is not intended that you should just leave it alone as an infant babe and every Christmas, for example, say, Gisu Bambino. You understand? It's not within yourself to keep that infant Messiah an infant, but to let the Christ consciousness grow up into the divine manhood. Now, I heard a kind of a clever explanation of this, brought out, and I know that half of the people in here won't understand me, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway because you will remember it, whether you understand it or not, and someday you will understand it. He said, we must learn to come to the place of the skull, Golgotha, where we find the Christ crucified between the two malefactors the anterior and posterior lobes of the pituitary gland, climbing the 33 steps of the spinal ladder until we have burned to ashes all of our human creation. Now the whole idea here is that the Christ always develops from within and never develops from without, yet the outer experiences are those which drive man to turn within. And so it has been calculated. And the dearth of truth in our age is because men are turning always without in order to solve their problem. They keep turning without. They turn everything inside out and upside down. And quite naturally, things do not work out as God intended, although sometimes people are successful in all of their perfidy in uh, eating themselves to death or drinking themselves to death or in general hastening their way to the uh, time when the Grim Reaper comes along and says, now this is it. It's true. And I can cite as an example the terrific rebellion 
in our youth today that has gone into the motorcycle clubs, into the beatniks, into the dope addicts, into the LSD users, and into all these others who have gone on that trail. I can also cite your terrific, maddening business rush at the DuPont Corporation, and we have our offices in Wilmington, by the way, ourselves, at the DuPont Corporation at Wilmington, Delaware. I learned when I was talking with uh, one of our officials that works with us there that the DuPont company was losing as many as 20% of their top flight executives with heart attacks, strokes, and other things of that nature. And these were men from 42 up to 55, around in there. And they were losing a lot of them, of course, from then on up till they were 65. So they went out and rented or bought, I don't know which they did, a yacht. And they put it on the river there, and they arranged parties with their families of these employees to go out and relax. Because the building tensions were so terrific that they were tearing those people apart. Now this is what you have today going on in the world. Well, we don't want that, although sometimes I feel that the pace we have here is just about as bad. I may as well confess to you. I mean, you people have no idea uh, just how terrific it is to get out our material with the staff we have, and they're very efficient and very good. But if they lack efficiency, I lay it to myself because I feel that I have to get a little more with it in order to be able to train and retrain people so that they can do the job a little better, a little easier. But these are the problems of our time, and they are material problems. And it is these problems and the maelstrom of those problems, the whirl, that actually occupy about 90% of our attention during our waking hours, and 10% is involved in some form of fun. Sometimes the fun turns out to be a little more taxing even than the daily grind. So in order to develop the Christ consciousness, we have to let go of the world for certain stated periods. And I don't think we should condemn others or ourselves if we have failed in the past. Jesus himself went up into the mountain to pray. This signified coming apart from the world. Jesus got on a boat, a fishing boat, a stinky old fishing boat probably. I mean, most of them are, you know. And out they went into Galilee, out into the sea, and they got away from the shoreline, they got away from the people, and there they communed with God. They didn't have all of our modern scientific inventions. They had maybe one article of clothing. They didn't carry much along in suitcases like some of our women do. But uh, the men are worse. The first time we went out to California, we just about took up one whole train compartment. We had things piled clear to the ceiling. I even had a radio transmitter along with me so I could broadcast. I was going to be able to talk from my hotel room all over the city back and forth to my wife. Oh, we had everything. We had so many porters when we, we went up to the hotel there that I guess they thought I was uh, the uh, Shah of Iran or something coming in. Well, never again. I remember one time I walked in my, into my purple robe on into the hotel and the guy looked at me and he says, are you a king or something? So we really have had some time learning what to do about what we take with us. I had microscopes and telescopes and heaven only knows what I had. Well, I'm cutting it down now. And the whole idea is if you want to develop Christ consciousness, you've got to cut down some of your excess baggage, your mental baggage. You've got to get rid of, of your fears of uh, the present life or the hereafter, because you know you're not going to die. That's the whole idea. The easiest thing in the world would be to die. 
because then all your worries would be gone right along with you. But the whole idea here is that we have to develop Christ consciousness sometime, somewhere. It's got to come or else we're not going to live. That sounds kind of enigmatic. You can't die and I say not going to live. But what I'm going to say is what the Lord told me. He said, the way that scripture means, uh, the scripture that says, no man can look upon the face of God and live. He says that means no man can look upon the face of God and live as man. Because when you've seen the face of God, you don't live as man anymore. You live as God. It makes a change in you. People don't have to see it. They may not recognize it. They may not even know it. But you will know it. And that's all that's necessary. It's strictly between you and God. And you've got to learn to go into your closet, which means shutting out the world. And when you get into that closet, see that there's no one at all anywhere but yourself and God. That is a moment of communion. The moment of shutting out all these harassing, distressing states of consciousness that we have developed. I sometimes think that we have spent more time in the swamp than we ever have on the mountaintop. And I think most of us will agree with that. Why have we done this, though? That's the question. We have to ask ourselves, why have we done it? Mimicry. We people are better mimics than the monkeys. We just sit and look at people and we do exactly what other people do. And our vision is not centered on our presence and on the ascended masters, even in our own activity. The thing that is producing great changes in our people is often coming from attendance at a service once a week. Think of it. Once a week, people come up here or they come to our other centers and they go through a period of decrees, they hear a dictation, and these things, and yet these people are getting blessed, and they're getting wonderfully helped. But think if we could only give a little more of our time to the development of ourselves in the Christ consciousness and in developing Christ consciousness in others. It is a matter of investment. If a young man learns to play the stock market, and he takes his money that he got from a newspaper route and he puts it into the market. He wins, he gets it doubles on him. Then he gets into a stock split. And this gets bigger and bigger. And the time he's ready to go to college, he's made a lot of money in stocks and bonds, you see. Well, he had to invest his money. That first little nest egg that he had, he had to have faith that he would be able to do something with it. And he had to put it in there. You have to put money in the bank if you expect to be able to take it out. I've never seen any bank anywhere yet that will let you take it out unless you put it in. And most banks today give you just a little bit more than what you put in. And that is the whole story. You can go into all the formulas you want to. The whole story is to use your faculties of seeing smelling, tasting, and hearing, feeling, those five senses. You use your senses spiritually and start looking toward God. Now the first thing that's going to happen to you is that you're going to suddenly find you can't visualize the face of God. You cannot do it. You're going to find you're just going to come up face to face with the fact that you can't. You can't even define the face of Jesus. Because every single person that ever sees Jesus, there's a lot of them that claim they've seen Jesus, every one of them that draws a picture of Jesus or paints a picture, they all come out with a different face. And so we have Solomon and we have Coleman and we have Jambor and we have all these different heads of Christ. Some people say, oh, I love the Solomon head. I love the Coleman head. Oh, I don't like that. I like Jambor. He's more mystical. And so we go on. And Hoffman. Well, when it comes to defining the face of God or defining the face of Christ, 
It is an individual thing based on individual perception. And if we were all artists and all could draw our perceptions down, they would all probably be a little bit different. Therefore, we must recognize that we are nurturing and nourishing our own individualized Christ manifestation. And if you want to develop Christ consciousness, start in getting away from the idea that you are developing something that is stable in the universe from the standpoint of humanity. It is not stable to humanity. It is only going to be stable to you. And you have to come into your own intimate relationship with the Christ. All of these other things, however, are fine. Coleman is inspirational. Hoffman is inspirational. All these people help us to visualize. Why do you suppose we have the chart? Who could paint God? Who could even paint man as he really is? Therefore, the chart is an assist. Beautiful music is an assist. Prayer and contemplation is an assist. All culture and art should be captivated by the mind to help develop the Christ consciousness within ourselves. Now, other people need Christ consciousness beside ourselves. And one good way of developing Christ consciousness for yourself is to help other people develop what you haven't yet developed yourself. How do you like that? You haven't developed it in its fullness yourself, but you try by harmony to help other people to develop it. You try by understanding other people and their problems. A little while ago, we talked about the negative side of it. We first talked about not criticizing them. Well, now, how about a little praise for people, for their efforts? Someone says, well, they haven't tried very hard. I mean, I saw them do something that wasn't right not too long ago. Now you're back on the negative side again. We don't want that. We're going to throw that out. Come to the positive side. Did you ever consider what praise does for a person? even for a little child. You go up to the child and you praise a little bit of a drawing they made. It's so crude that you wonder if even a gnome would look at it with any joy, let alone a sylph or an undine. So here you have this crude drawing. You say, oh, Johnny, isn't that beautiful? The efforts you made are so wonderful and the drawing is so nice. Now, you know it isn't nice. What are you doing then, being a big fat hypocrite? No, you're not a hypocrite. You're a parent, or you're a teacher, or you're a friend of this child. You are praising an effort that in its own level was designed to be something grand and lovely. And this is what you have to learn to do to develop Christ consciousness in other people as well as yourself, is to learn to recognize and to praise noble effort in people. Don't try to classify it. Don't try to judge it and say, well, this man is just a step from his 10th initiation into the great Zuma, 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 whatever that is. That's probably Montezuma. Anyway, you decide that somebody is up here in this or that initiation and you're capable of judging them, of course. You're down here in the... Uh, some kind of an outer court here, but you're capable of judging these great beings that are gone way up. I have it all the time. I have people come into the meeting and a master will speak. Every once in a while somebody comes in the audience and they'll say, well, that master didn't know the past participle. And I think if he was a master, he would have known it. I had one man in Washington, D.C. when I first was a messenger that condemned the fact that when St. Germain was dictating through me, that he pronounced the fleur de lis wrong. Now, the correct way of pronouncing it is fleur de lis, not fleur de lay, not the fleur de lay, and there's several other ways that people say it. There's an American way, and there's a, a French way, and there's a way that the French scholars say it, too, and that's fleur de lis. Now, 
I all my life had pronounced it a certain way and I was wrong. Now, it wouldn't matter if St. Germain would speak to me or God Almighty unless he drew me a blueprint as fast as the dictation comes. And there wouldn't be time to draw a blueprint. They have to use the idioms of the prophet. And this is brought out very carefully by St. Paul and some of the other apostles where they say the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, which is clearly an explanation of the fact that their consciousness is moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And if they say ain't, which we don't usually hear from a master, but if they say ain't or tisn't or some other word or go off the beaten path there, it isn't really the fault of the master who certainly does know better. It simply means that the form that came into the consciousness from the master's level was misinterpreted in the English language. So this man came up to me and he had been chasing me all over town, trying to get acquainted with me, he wanted to go out to dinner with me. He thought that the sun rose and set in me. I had a telephone in the car and he went to the phone and he called me in the car. Yeah, he really was friendly. He came to one meeting and he heard that mispronounced fleur de lis, still that was pronounced fleur de lay or something like that, and he said to me, he moved away from where I was eating in this place and he went across the room, he wouldn't even sit by me, and I walked over and asked what was the matter with him, and he said to me, he said, I'll have you to know that you are a false prophet. I said, oh, well, I'm happy to hear that. Why do you say that? And he said, the French language has been spoken for so many years, and he, I don't know how many thousand years he told me now. He was with the State Department, by the way, Washington. But he got kicked out. But anyway, he said, and it has always been spoken correct, and he says, St. Germain has spoken correct French for years and years and years. And he said, I'll have you to know that I have listened to trans mediums all over this country, and they speak perfect Chinese and they don't know a word of Chinese in their uh, natural state. He says, you are a false prophet. Well, I just point out how silly, how very silly people can be to judge either a book by its cover or by uh, even its first chapter. I know I wouldn't even dare to judge myself on that basis. I don't even know myself the end it shall one day be even at the end of one cycle. And it really wouldn't be any fun the way God has planned it if we knew the end from the beginning. Because it wouldn't be any, it would be like going to an old movie that we'd seen at least 25 times. I heard recently of a woman in Denver who went to see The Sound of Music. I think it was either 200 times or 300 times. She went to see The Sound of Music. Well, she probably didn't know what the actor, Christopher Plummer, called the sound of music. It was terrible, hideous. He called it the sound of mucus. And that's the state of his consciousness, you see. That's how he thinks, because he was sick of it. And it really wasn't what he wanted to play. He prefers villains. Maybe that's because he is a villain. Who knows? But it just goes to show you how these things work. And so we have to get away from the ideas of judging people. We have to get away from the ideas of thinking wrong. We have to tune with the Christ. Think as the Christ would think. Get apart from the world. Put on a defensive armor against those who would dethrone us the moment we start. Now this is a very important point. The minute you start to come apart unto God, the world will hate you as it hated Jesus. You can expect it. But you don't have to amplify it by letting your expectations run away with you, which I've seen some people do. You can always invite problems. 
It's so easy to invite them. So the main thing then is to help other people to develop price consciousness while you're keeping your armor on, while you're setting your hours apart for attunement, and while you can forget the idea of making a drawing of Jesus Christ or of God. Why did I say that last remark? I said, while well, you can forget. I meant that exactly and specifically. Stop trying to define the Almighty. If you want to put a building up in the air, like the Washington Monument, you lay one brick on another brick, and it all is tied to a foundation. But what do we have now in America? We have psychics and psychic phenomena seekers all over the country who don't bother to put their bricks on foundations. They start with an airy nothingness. Voices that peep and mutter or speak Chinese or something else. Well, that's nothing. That's nothing at all. I have tuned in as, as Risa Stevens has with events, and probably you have too, with events that took place thousands of years ago and seen these scenes almost as clearly in color, like on a color TV, as though they were actually happening. But all of that is what we call Akashic Records. And when you start to develop in Christ consciousness, you must be very careful that you do not get caught up in the astral or in these Akashic Records of the past which often occurs in states of reverie that sometimes accompany meditation. You start to meditate on God. And while you're meditating on God, the first thing you know, you're kind of in a dreamy state and uh, you may see the face of some boy chum of yours or a girlfriend suddenly float before your consciousness, disconnected, you know, and looks there it is for a minute, it has no meaning, and it goes off and something else comes along. And it's kind of a phantomagoria, you call it. Because it is nothing more than a playback from the subconscious memory of your world in a haphazard manner without organization. Just one thing after another. This is just letting reverie and imagination run away with you. Now this is an enemy of developing Christ consciousness. So all imagery latent, present or otherwise, has to be put away. And consciousness has to be alerted. Now this is a little bit deep, but it's the truth and I have to put it out. You have to get away from reverie and from sights and smells and sounds of the past in order to develop Christ consciousness because you haven't had it before. What you have had before is human consciousness. Now we're going to put off the old man and put on the new. And we must get into a frame of reference that at least resembles what you think the new should resemble. Does that make any sense to you at all? In other words, you've got to start with these bricks and build on the fashion of things as they are in the human. So you, if you want to visualize Jesus, I visualize him without too much definition in the face. That's the way I started several years ago. And I mainly visualized the white robe and the radiance coming out of that robe. And I didn't try to be too definite with it. I let the, the image develop on the film, if you know what I mean. I just let it develop in a latent way. And I, I kept my attention on God because God is, is higher than the Christ, the Christ coming out of the source, you see. But God is a spirit. And of a spirit it was spoken that the spirit is like the wind, that it blows here and it blows there, you see. Nobody sees it. So you don't really see the God, but you see the God as the light emanating in the Christ. So to develop Christ consciousness, you have to meditate on this. And a funny thing will sometimes happen. After you're doing this for so long a time, you're looking on the Christ, you may suddenly feel currents running all over your hands down through your whole body, and down to your feet. And you'll suddenly feel a sense of joy, a tremendous joy, an almost unspeakable joy. And you are getting a wave of the Christ's radiation. 
And that wave passing through you aligns the parts of your being, the inward parts, with the same matrices of the Christ. In other words, you're putting Christ patterns in your subconscious cell body. All the little cells, the building blocks of your physical, and the memory body, they all are charged with that radiance. And that's how you develop Christ consciousness. Then you develop it through good deeds, through harmony, through love. But watch out in these areas that someone doesn't try to get you to define it. Because in its definition it becomes lost. It's overdevelopment. See, the light is so powerful. In photography, it would bring you a washed out negative. You have to put stops on a camera. You have to stop things down. You understand that. And then you develop an image that is realistic to you. There will be greater images in dealing with transcendence. Because transcendence means to surpass itself. And you just keep on surpassing it. But you cannot develop the image of God and the image of the pure white light to the same degree that the great masters do while you're unascended. Why, if you developed some of these images to the fullest degree, you wouldn't even be here. And you wouldn't be there either. You wouldn't be anywhere. You'd become absorbed by the light. And that's not the plan of God. Stop-downs are so that man can get an image and then develop into the image himself. So he can learn to jump over a 12-foot hurdle without breaking his leg or anything else and then go to a 12 and a half foot. You see what I mean? You have to take it by stages and steps. God will never hinder you or never slow you up. But you can go too fast by pushing yourself without having the necessary supporting moral standard of values behind yourself. You can't fool God and you can't fool man. You can't fool God or man anytime and you can't fool yourself in reality. You have to face the truth you have to build everything solid all the way through on the foundation of the Christ by simply saying, what would Jesus do? What would Christ do in this situation? I stood in the lobby of a theater and a drunk came along and he got a great big bag of popcorn and he had them put double butter on it and then proceeded to dump the whole thing, popcorn and butter, all over my nice suit, all the way down my front. Well, I didn't hit him, and I was reasonably self-contained, but I didn't live quite the way as I should have done. I made him pay for the dry cleaning of the suit. That was several years ago. If I had it to do over again, I would just say, well, it's a mistake, God bless you. Instead of that, he didn't offer to pay for it. He got a little abusive with me anyway. So I went ahead and made him pay for it. He didn't think I could, but I did. I took it as a human challenge. But I was wrong. And this is what you have to do, is admit your mistakes all the way down the line. If you're wrong, admit them. You don't have to admit them to other people. This is a foolish idea that people have. They think you have to run and admit every mistake to somebody else and get down and kiss their boots. If you feel that you have wronged someone to the point where it's causing them grief, you can go to them and say, I'm genuinely sorry for what I did and I hope you forgive me. But you do not have to do this. I have done it and I would do it again if I felt it was necessary. Each circumstance breeds its own solution and we must learn to accept that. Now I have skipped around here with a lot of basic ideas and developing Christ consciousness. But I think if you put all these ideas together in their perspective and then cut out the rotten core, which was some of the human things I had to bring in, and this is something you're going to have to learn, you have to recognize that you cannot destroy the tares and pull them up without pulling up good wheat. This is a mistake a lot of people make. They try to spiritualize themselves overnight. And they get discouraged because they don't see it manifesting overnight. Stop that foolishness. You are exactly today the sum total of all that you have been in the past. 
and your future will be the sum total of all that you have been in the past too, and all that you shall be, in other words. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to start over. It's never too late to correct your errors. But remember, the way it works is this. You have a lattice work, like you put roses on. You have this lattice work, and that represents the human, represents the material consciousness. Now you have good and bad wood here. You have nice, good, pure wood with a lot of good paint on it, well preserved, and you have rotten wood. Now what you've got to do is let the rose of the soul climb through this lattices. It keeps on climbing through the lattices, and the fragrance of the soul permeates everything. The roses just come through. And then suddenly the light comes through. And the light comes through and every bit of the rotten wood is cut right out of that and all of the rest of the wood is changed and wherever the rotten wood was it fills out and there you have what amounts to eternal substance. And the roses are growing on that. Do you see what I mean or what I'm trying to convey? I hope you do. You have to build out of the temporary reality of the present into the eternal reality of God. And if you can do this without strain, with no sense of struggle, recognizing your fellow pilgrims on the path and all humanity as travelers on the upward way, no matter what their state of consciousness, you are going to become a Christ. But you're only going to become a Christ because your consciousness changes from a human into a Christ. Today my consciousness recognizes the fact in regard to the popcorn, and perhaps I should have done that a little differently, you see. Yet, even a Christ does not always behave in a manner that everyone might agree with. Jesus went around and he whipped and he kicked over the tables in the temple and he gave them a good calling down. He did it, it's written. I've discussed this with him. He told me, he said, if I had this to do over, it is one of the things that I would not have done that way. And that's absolutely true. He said, how could I recommend this to my followers? How could I recommend that they go out today and try this? He said they'd be in jail or somewhere. And I wouldn't want to put them in jail. But in the peculiar era in which he lived, and under the circumstances where political foment was going on in Jerusalem, and under the state of his zeal, quote, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, he could do this. But you see, God didn't uh, impute this to him. That didn't stop him from being a Christ. So even today, some of the Christs that are here on earth, and there are a few, they don't always behave exactly as human beings think they should behave because they will not always get the results that way. Sometimes, even by God direction, I have dealt with people in the outer world a certain peculiar way, and they learn something by it. And that's what the Master wanted. But this is something you don't want to try until you know. Otherwise, you may be paying off a lot of karma. <laughs> and we, we, we want to cut our karma down, don't we? We don't want to build it up, do we? What is that you always tell me? It builds you out? Oh. <laughs> well, anyway, I thank you for your, your attention. Uh, this being a lecture, I'm not going to look for a happy ending. I think it was happy all the way through. And uh, I hope it was as happy for you as it was for me. You, you had good faces all the way through. I didn't have to visualize too hard. You know, sometimes you get a certain type of audience, they look, then you have to go, you know, and all these silly things, you know, in order to, it's like my friend used to walk into a businessman's office and they'd look at him through their spectacles, you know, and they'd look at him a very belittling glance that was supposed to freeze him right on the spot because he was a salesman. And uh, I said, well, how are you always so successful? I said, you always 
No, nothing seems to bother you. I said, those people, they bother me. I said, when I get a guy like that, I just want to run away. He said, I have no trouble with them at all. He said, I just imagine them standing there in long red underwear. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. So I am ending the lecture on the Christ consciousness at this time.